So hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for another of our Alumni and Academia webinars. It's great to have you all here. Uh, we're delighted to welcome alumna Marie Colkenbrock to give a talk on Hedgehog Humanities. And again, the webinar has attracted seven decades of alumni through from 1953 uh, to current pressure in 2020, as well as fellow staff and parents. So welcome to you all and thank you for joining. And also thank you to all of you who've also donated to help support students at this time as well. And we have alumni across five different countries, the UK, the USA, Germany, Switzerland, and Australia. Uh, so if you're watching live in Australia, um, it's the middle of the night. <laughs> Um, before handing over to Marie, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Leila Makeda, who's our Staff Fellow and Director of Studies in M MML um, and a University Lecturer in Modern German Studies. She joined Trinity Hall two years ago, so it's a quick opportunity for her to say hello to you all uh, before taking the Q&A at the end of Marie's talk. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the webinar and we will be putting the recording on the website in due course. But I'll hand over to Leila. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, as, as Shell said, my name is Leila Makeda. I'm a fellow in German here um, at, at Trinity Hall. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really have much to say about myself, apart from the fact that I mostly work on film and I teach topics relating to German cultural studies from, I guess, post-war to now, with a real focus on intersectionality. Um, it's, I, I guess, um, I, I'm going to talk about Marie now because that's why we're here. And I can just say what a pleasure it is to be um, here and listening to your talk, Marie. Um, Marie Kolkenbrock is a, is a Branco Vice Fellow in the Department of German at King's College London um, and a Trinity Hall alumna, as, as Shell said, graduating in 2014. Um, I got to know Marie when she was a postdoctoral fellow here in the Department of German and Dutch and, and a dear colleague as well. Um, and at that time she was working on uh, a postdoctoral project on the Viennese modernist author Arthur Schnitzler, um, about whom she also wrote her first book, Stereotype and Destiny in Arthur Schnitzler's um, prose, which was published with Bloomsbury in 2018. She is a woman of interesting and far-reaching, um, I guess, scholarly interests, as you'll see shortly. Um, she's just co-edited a, a journal, um, a journal issue on the topics of politics of refusal. So, what the implications are for saying no or I'd rather not. And I'm really looking forward to to, to that, um, Marie. Um, Today, however, she'll be talking about the research she's undertaking as part of her um, current fellowship at KCL on the concept of distance. Um, really, really such a pleasure, such a warm welcome to you, Marie. Um, before I hand over, I'll just say very quickly um, to those watching, if you have questions, um, please feel free to type them into the Q&A box. You can type them as they come to you um, or wait until the talk is finished. Um, before, before putting them in there and then I'll call on you. Um, I think Marie's going to talk for about um, 30 minutes, I believe, um, and then we'll hand over to you. So um, with no further ado, um, over to you, Marie, thank you. Thank you so much, Leila and also Michelle um, for the invitation and this uh, wonderful introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be, well, back at Trinity Hall, I guess, even though we're not really back. Um, and just as a, a brief disclaimer, um, as we have to do these days, um, my not even two year old daughter is going to come home from nursery in the next 15, 20 minutes and she's not going to come in, but you might hear her. Um, I hope that that it won't be too disruptive. So I will just uh, jump in right now and uh, share my screen because I have a little bit of a presentation for you. So there we are good um yeah distance is um arguably one of the terms that we will forever associate with the changes that this um strange and in many ways horrendous year of 2020 has brought on and last year when i 
received the funding for my current research project, Cultures and Cultivations of Distance, it was certainly unimaginable that um, negotiations of distance and closeness would be so omnipresent in our everyday lives and um, that we would actually get quite used to coming together in the distanced way that we are um, meeting tonight. Um, but perhaps, perhaps we also find that distance has now taken on some counterintuitive meanings. Um, we might associate it now with caring and forms of solidarity, whereas nearness, closeness, and proximity suddenly um, are accompanied by a sense of uneasiness, by um, the danger of um, transmitting or um, catching um, coronavirus. And so in the next 30 minutes or so, I want to give you a brief workshop report of my project because I believe that looking at the cultural history of the concept of distance and what we actually mean when we say distance in many in, in different contexts may be helpful or may, may, may help us think about um, how these new distancing practices that we are forced to cultivate these days may impact our sense of togetherness um, in private relationships, but also um, in our society and maybe even at a global level. So I invite you now to um, to kind of come follow me back to the beginning of the 20th century, because this little porcupine that you see on the screen on my um, title slide um, belongs to no other than the founding father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud. Um, and you can actually visit this little porcupine in the Freud Museum in London right now, and as long as it's still open and we're allowed to go to museums. Um, and a passage in, in Sigmund Freud's text, uh, Group Psychology and uh, the Analysis of the Ego, gives us an insight why this, this little porcupine might have been important to him. He writes here, according to Schopenhauer's famous simile of the freezing porcupines, no one can tolerate a too intimate approach to his neighbor. And the Schopenhauer tale that uh, Freud is referring to, to, um, to here tells of a group of freezing porcupines uh, that try to huddle together for warmth on a cold day, only to disperse again because they were feeling each other's spines. And Schopenhauer relates that also human porcupines need to um, find the right balance between closeness and distance um, in order to coexist peacefully. And this really brings us to um, the central question of that, that I'm trying to explore in my project. And that is, what does the concept of distance um, have to do with um, the question of how to live together? And um, I'm looking at um, different theories from different disciplines that are concerned with this question of how, how we live together. I'm looking at um, philosophical anthropology, psychology, sociology, um, psychology, and but also literature and film. And all these disciplines um, produce theories that are concerned with the question of how we should live together peacefully or without collision. Um, and I, that, that's why I summarize those different theories um, in the course of my talk, talk under the label theories of cohabitation, but so you know what I, I'm talking about. So far so broad, let me dial it back a little bit. First of all, what do I actually mean when I say distance? Distance, of course, um, in the first instance, uh, means physical separation, so the length of space between two points. But um, distance is also used as a metaphor for social difference. Um, so distance as a meta, uh, diff distance as a metaphor for um, socially constructed differences, um, um, for for cultural uh, for cultural and economic differences, um, including social distances, including also gender, um, uh, class, race, and ethnicity. Then distance is also used as a metaphor for emotional detachment. So forms of interpersonal distance, for example. And I want to suggest that the interrelation of these three meanings of distance, physical, emotional, and social, forms a central aspect of the theories of cohabitations in the 20th century, up, right up until our current debates, um, when we're debating of how, how we should live together. In other words, distance 
um, and that's the leading premise of my pro um, project, is one of the most central conceptual tools that we use when we address the experience of living together. And in the current pandemic, we have experienced firsthand how these spatial, social, and emotional conceptions of distance intersect and how these intersections in inform our ethics of cohabitation. For example, there have been discussions that it might be more accurate to talk about um, physical distancing when we're talking about social distancing, when, when, when we use um, the term social distancing, um, trying to make clear or trying to emphasize that excess excessive interpersonal distance um, may have consequences for public mental health that might may be as dire as the virus itself, itself in the long run. And it seems obvious that um, the necessity of physical distancing, distancing creates new needs um, to find new ways to be close to one another um, in private relationships as well as in our local communities and societies. There's also the urgent need, of course, to overcome interpersonal, cultural, and spatial distances in our um, quest to, to, slow, to slow the spread of the, vi the virus. At the same time, the pandemic has heightened our sense of social distance um, and the injustices that come with it. Inequalities in housing and um, healthcare have been um, recurring features of the pandemic. So I think the, the coronavirus has um, kind of shown us that there's a need for, uh, for conceptual clarity when we talk about distance. And when we look at those theories of um, the 20th century, those theories of cooperations, we can generally identify two main ways in which distance is uh, conceptualized. One distance is, first distance is seen as a problem of modernity. So something that we have to try to overcome. And then distance is also seen as a solution for certain problems of modernity. So it emerges as something that we should cultivate um, or establish. That distance could be a problem for modern life or, or that comes with modern lives may be less surprising to, to many of you because um, there are certain buzzwords that we associate with, with modernity, like alienation or individualization that um, are often limited as um, yeah, loss of contact or uh, loss of warmth and community and loss of, loss of solidarity. But conversely, modernity has often been described as an age of over-proximity. Modern developments like urbanization and industrialization led to experiences of crowdedness, of being too close to other people's bodies. And particularly the new science of um, bacteriology that was launched by Robert Koch's discovery of the anthrax bacillus in 1876 had created a completely new awareness of the Possibility, possible contagious quality of these properties that we, are, we were suddenly close to. And an awareness, an uneasy awareness of the permeability of physical boundaries. So some of the anxieties that we have reason to feel at the moment were also felt at the beginning of the 20th century or the turn of the century. But apart from these experiences of physical proximity and maybe the feelings of um, and easiness, and easiness that they um, brought about, uh, we can also recognize a tradition of thought in the 20th century that stresses the importance of the cultivation of interpersonal and emotional distance for a society with um, a well-functioning well public sphere. And we will, um, what that means, we will um, address a bit later. So I've um, come to the end of my first section and I have three sections of this talk. So there's two more sections after this. In the next section, I will um, make things a bit clearer to give you two examples. Um, one um, from the beginning of the 20th century, one that sees uh, distance as a problem of modernity that needs to be overcome. And the other one that um, introduces distance or the cultivation of distance as a solution. And in the last section, I want to kind of discuss what these um, theories of distance in the 20th century might have to say, or how we can maybe use them to discuss um, the implications of distance these days. So let's um, go right to the example um, of distance as a problem. Excuse me. <clears throat> in 1915, 
the physiologist Georg Friedrich Nikolai uh, publishes the book, the, Bio the Biology of War. Here Nikolai offered um, a critique of social Darwinism that had been used to legitimize war as um, a biological necessity. And if you look at the date, 1915 is obviously the second year of uh, the First World War. And Nikolai was a pacifist, so he wanted to argue against this argument uh, or this idea that um, war could be legitimized um, as, as just being in, in, in man's nature, basically. So Nikola argued that humans can overcome their aggressive tendencies by focusing on something that he called germplasm. And you can see the um, illustration in his book here. Germplasm is a apparently a 19th century precursor for, um, um, for DNA theory. So it's a, it's a 19th, theory, uh, 19th century theory about hereditary relations. Um, and Nikola used this, uh, used this, this, um, this scientific knowledge of his time in order to, to promote the idea that um, there was a human instinct of love that was rooted in, um, in this germ pleasant that all, all people share. So significantly, love for the other is not an ethical or religious choice for Nikolai, but is based in, uh, but, but is, a, is a based in biology, is a biological fact. Um, and according to Nikolai, the answer, um, how we can um, overcome our aggressive tendencies, or the, the distances between people, lies in this germ plasm. He writes, the victory of germ plasm over somatic plasm is humanity's victory over the individual consciousness, is altruism's victory over egotism. So while the body, the somatic plasm, plasm separates us, and that's a problem for Nikolai, the, the, the separation and the distance between us because our bodies are separate, can be overcome by chyme plasma um, that bridges the distance between our physical boundaries. For Nikolai, here lies the hope um, of overcoming individual selfishness, which is rooted in the body. And so he's mixing biological and biblical terms. Nikolai thus pretty much offers a, a scientific or a scientification of uh, the Christian love thy neighbor, which obviously in itself is not very scientific, but he's using scientific knowledge to kind of push for his pacifist ideas. And he kind of thought that doing the war, uh, nationalism in Germany and Austria had acted as a metaphorical chymplasma, uh, germplasm um, for Germans and Austrians, so that they bec were becoming connected, like a connected organism that um, could stand united against the enemies, the Allied forces. Um, and of course, this homogeneous connectedness relied heavily on the exclusion of anything that was lying beyond the borders of the central powers. So Nikolai's impulse was to extend this concept of connectedness as a model for humanity across national borders. Um, so it may be kind of seen as an, attempt, uh, as an attempt to retain the benefits of the warmth and closeness that is inherent in the concept of national community without the violent element of exclusion. So the idea was that biology could help us overcome both cultural and geographical distances. However, it has to be said that Nicolo himself was not able to live up to this ideal, um, because when you look at this book rather closely, you realize that he's talking about Europe, maybe about the United States. So he's focused on the Western world, um, has, has a deeply Eurocentric fo focus and also a pro-colonialist imp pro imp impetus. So for definitely for, for Nicolai himself, this, this idea of connectivity via germplasm had its limits. And we will discuss a bit later why generally it might be problematic and we, that why, why Nicolai might be a good example, why it might be problematic to create an ideal of solidarity that is based on, on overcoming distance, on, on kind of, yeah, negate, negating distance. Let us now turn to my counter example um, in which this distance appears as a solution. In 1924, Helmut Plessner publishes his philosophical anthropological study, The Limits of Community. Rather than hoping to overcome interpersonal distance, Plessner's study proposes a civilized society based on the cultivation of distance. So distance is here the solution. The public sphere is for Plessner certainly an antagonistic one in which everyone is striving for recognition, but is terrified of shame. And that obviously has to be seen in um, the context of, of the interwar years in Germany where 
um, shame, that the experience of shame was deeply connected to then losing World War I. So for Plessner, the idea was that one had to find the balance between exposing, between um, making oneself recognizable, be, be, between being seen and um, um, not exposing oneself, not embarrassing oneself. Therefore, the individual has to protect himself. And I say himself advisedly because it's pretty clear that for Plessner, the public sphere is a completely male domain. Um, so the individual has to protect himself by armoring himself with the mask of convention. And it's very interesting, this balance in Plessner between um, kind of a military vocabulary, so, so armoring himself um, and masking, which um, obviously today has again new connotations, which we, um, we can talk about later. But um, there, there's a certain playfulness also in um, like a, yeah, the element of play um, in Plessner. So in a similar way as Schopenhauer's hedgehog dilemma uses spatial distance metaphorically in order to express our need for the right balance between intimacy and detachment, Plessner is concerned with maintaining a respectful interpersonal distance between individuals. However, these, dis these distancing practices have to be smoothed over by conventionally created codes of conduct. Plessner speaks of the virtuous play, the virtuous mastery of forms of play where persons come close to each other without meeting and where they establish distance without damaging each other through indifference. Forced distance becomes ennobled into reserve. The offensive indifference, coldness and rudeness of living past each other is made ineffective through forms of politeness respectfulness and attentiveness. Reserve counteracts the too great intimacy. Plessner thus suggests that establishing distance between individuals through conventions of tact and politeness and respect is the key for a well-functioning society. In his seminal 1992 study, Cool Conduct, the culture of distance in Weimar Germany, the cultural theorist Helmut Leighton discusses Plessner's text as a key example for a common idealization of cultivated distance in the German Weimar Republic. Uh, as I said earlier, a society whose traditional um, value system had been thoroughly destabilized. Um, and also one could say a society whose ego ideal of a, of a support, superior nation had been seriously destabilized um, because of losing World War I. But the need of maintaining a certain sociability of distance is articulated by many other thinkers in the 20th century way beyond the specific historical and geographical context. This idea of cultivating distance um, in the public sphere returns in different forms in writers like Theodor Adorno, Hannah Arendt, Roland Barthes, Eva Illus, um, and also Richard Sennett, just to name a few. And the last one mentioned in this exemplary and like I said, non-exhaustive list, Richard Sennett is famous, the sociologist Richard Sennett is famous for his formulation of the tyranny of the uh, tyranny of intimacy. In his 1977 monograph, The Fall of the Public Man, he claims that an overemphasis on personal, on the personal self, on self-realization, on, on private issues, has led to what he called the tyranny of intimacy, which leads to a political withdrawal. Um, and that, that, that disintegrates public discourse. And even though Senate does not quote Hannah Arendt, whose class he actually took at the University of Chicago in the 60s, um, they, they, both, um, they, they both share very similar ideas about this disintegration of the, um, of the public discourse. They both say that in modern societies, the boundary between public and private um, realm has become increasingly blurred, which has led to a distinct lack of distance and distance, however, is needed for the respectful and just navig navigation of the political realm. Hannah Arendt writes, respect is a kind of friendship without intimacy and without closeness. It is regard for the person from the distance which the space of the world has put between us. Senate in turn proposes indirection as a mode of collaboration in the political realm. He calls this, this mode of indirection subjunctive mood that opens up an indeterminate mutual space, the space in which strangers dwell with one another. 
Here, both Arendt's and Tennant's accounts sound strikingly similar to Klesner's ideal of polite reverse and distance as an appropriate form for public interaction. I want to say that I'm interested in these accounts of distance, but I'm not um, presenting these uncritically as um, actual kind of tour guides, <laughs> um, how we should live together. I think what, what in, in different ways, many of these, these accounts have in common is that there's not a lot of um, um, interest maybe, or at least there, there's not a lot of space um, that is used for, for the discussion of power structures and, asymmetric, uh, and the asymmetries in, in power structures. So there's this ideal of public interaction um, and it's not often discussed and, and they don't really discuss the, the accessibility for, the, um, for this ideal open realm. But that's something that we maybe also can address, address in the, um, the discussion. Let's just um, return to, to this ideal though of, of, um, of cultivated distance. Karina Stan has shown recently in her book, The Art of Distances, that um, Plesner's ideal of cultivated distance also returns in a number of literary writers in the 20th century. And crucially, while the historical and ge geographical contexts vary, as we've also seen um, in the sort of theoretical side, um, one may say that the articulation of a need for distance tends to be linked to the collective experience of crisis. My um, colleague and also fellow Trinity Hall alumna, Katja Haustein, who may or may not be in the audience right now, um, has described this um, aptly um, with regard to, the, to tact as the ideal form of cultivated distance, also with regard to Plesner. And she writes that um, these different accounts, Plesner, but also you know, she also is also referring to Adorno and Roland Barthes, um, what they have in common is a shared sense of crisis when responding to the following question. What distance must I maintain between myself and others if we are to construct a community without collision, a sociability without alienation, based on a form of individual freedom that may impl imply solitude, but not isolation. I'm coming now to the third um, part of my talk where I want to discuss what, um, what these, these cultural um, or the, the, these theories of distance um, may tell us today. And especially when we look at, um, at, at, at Katja Haustein's question here, it is, I think today when we read this, I mean, she wrote this um, in 2018, um, but when, when, when we read this question today, it, it is kind of a strange twist to have this question thrown back at us in a very literal way, I think. In our current situation, our concern is to maintain the right degree of physical distance in order to protect ourselves and others. And of, of course, we are less concerned with um, embarrassing ourselves um, from each other maybe as, as, as was Plesner's priority, but um, we are concerned with protecting ourselves from viral infection. And um, when it comes to the need for quantitative, quantitative analysis, for example, when we want to know how much distance um, between our bodies is needed to protect ourselves and others from infection. Most people would rightfully prefer the assessment of a virologist um, to that of a cultural theorist or philosophical anthropologist like Helmut Plesner. However, I think that our concern with bodily protection and separation has wider, has wider implications for our practices of cohabitation. And like I said, I'm not here to promote Plesner completely and critically as our tour guide, um, for how to live together, ne and, and neither aren't or Senate for that matter. I think that some of um, their arguments against closeness and for cultivation of distance in the public sphere may be insightful to our current situation. Um, this is just an illustration of <laughs> exemplary uh, um, uh, illustration of um, social distancing. I'm not going to talk about wheels or bike bicycles now. Um, but rather about how every day now we have to negotiate new rules for interpersonal interaction. What used to be a gesture of kindness, such as guiding an elderly person across the street, may now put the same person at risk. Foregoing the handshake is more polite than offering it. Crossing to the other side of the road can now be seen as a sign of um, respect um, for the other's comfort rather than an expression of animosity. And besides the unease um, or even fear that the virus itself 
and it inevitably brings. I think it is the disruption of everyday conventions that we have internalized for all our lives that in, in general, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, um, feelings of unsettledness and irritabil irritability. I think we've experienced a little bit um, some sort of adjustment to the new codes of interpersonal conduct over the summer. But in the long run, I believe that we may need more new conduct codes, as Plesner would say, new forms of respect, politeness, and tact to make our minimal contact with strangers bearable to integrate the new um, distancing practice in some way. And if we follow Richard Sennett, we may be concerned with the way the pandemic forces us to withdraw into the privacy of the rather conservative concept of the household and how it may therefore pose a, th a threat for public debate and engagement. And this is not an argument against the protective measures of social distancing, of course, but an inv invitation to think about how we can, th can find new ways to dwell with strangers, as Senate would say, um, while coming together in public spaces is so severely restricted. When we think about private relationships, um, Plesner, Arendt, and Senate have less to say about, about those because they were not so interested in them, in, at least not in their theories. Um, but it seems obvious that here too, we have to come up with new conduct codes. Um, obviously, these should not cultivate more distance, but rather um, find new ways or new forms of intimacy and closeness. It is too early to say, um, but I'm wondering whether our verbal communication is already changing, um, whether it's becoming more intimate in order to express connection when um, the physical ways of doing so um, have become limited. And this is obviously very anecdotal and evidence, but I came across this tweet um, of this professor who said that after a Zoom class, students suddenly had started to say, <laughs> love you, bye, instead of just thank you, bye. Um, and I'm wondering if that expresses maybe in a heightened need um, in our language to, to, to create intimacy in our language because we are so separate. And that's not a bad thing. I think these, these, um, this example show, shows that in times of uncertainty, we want to come closer together and that's okay. But and, and actual symbolic gestures of love and generosity will help us to feel connected while personal contact is restricted. But we have to be cautious, I think, when attempts to overcome the imposed distance, um, when they turn into problematic idealizations of closeness. And what I mean by that will hopefully become clear um, shortly. Technically, the pandemic could inspire an ethics and politics of global interdependence. We have experienced firsthand what we could call the reversibility of proximity and distance. We have seen that elsewhere can turn into here within months or even weeks. And the global spread of the virus has obviously thrown into sharp relief our shared vulnerability, um, connectedness and sameness in some way. However, recall that Nikolai's um, germplasm theory was based on a very similar in, um, assumption of biological sameness and that that could be a foundation for global solidarity, but that he himself nevertheless remained caught up in his own Eurocentric worldview, Eurocentric and ultimately racist worldview. Nikolai would probably be an interesting example for the psychologist and cognitive scientist Paul Bloom, who has argued in his book Against Empathy in 2016 that spatial and social distance are determining factors in our problematically biased ability to feel empathy. In other words, how emotionally close we feel to someone tends to be influenced by our spatial and social distance to them. And even though moral philosopher Peter Singer argues that distance does not ma matter for our moral uh, um, obligations to others, it, it may well matter for our ethical decision-making if it is a psychological fact that our ability to care depends on how close we feel to others. And I believe that we have seen this play out in the, in, in the pandemic and not just in the sense that the Western world only started to really care about um, coronavirus when um, it was no longer just China's problem. We have seen, for example, this spring while governments all over the world urged their citizens to show, them, to, to show each other um, solidarity and care by social distancing measures, 
many nations closed their borders and suspended existing programs for asylum seekers. We may argue that despite occasional, occasional emphatic proclamations that we are all in this together, that there is a risk that the pandemic makes us turn inward and create forms of solidarity that are based on proximity that legitimize exclusionary practices. In her book, Men in Dark Times, Hannah Arendt suggests that a heightened need for closeness and intimacy is a marker of crisis. She says that in a very different context to ours right now, but I think it's nevertheless an interesting observation that can also apply to our current situation. Indeed, in our current situation, we must be cautious that the heightened need for closeness um, that is coming as a kind of compensation for our social distancing practices, that this heightened need for closeness does not reinforce the proximity bias of empathy and therefore guide political forms of solidarity that are based on closeness and proximity. The intersectional feminist um, scholar Sarah Ahmed um, has identified a dangerous political myth that she um, describes as if we only were closer, we would be as one. And this, according to Ahmed, this, this, this political myth tends to punitively exclude those who are, who the dominant culture deems to unfit to belong or who are seen as failing to integrate. Um, so that's just um, something I want to, to, to close with that it would not be the first time that a longing for warmth and um, for the warmth of community and the closeness of community could become exploited by nationalist forces. And um, I think this is where I will stop and I hope we'll have a little bit of a discussion of these different ideas now with Leila. Hi Marie, thank you so much for that really interesting, stimulating talk. Um, I'm looking at the Q&A box and I can't see any yet. So I would encourage our um, viewers to um, ask any question, um, uh, any related question to um, Marie, type it in there and I'll, I'll, I'll read it out. Um, I believe it's anonymous, so um, so only I will see it, and I'll, I'll put it to them and to put it to Marie. And if you'd rather remain anonymous, that's of course absolutely fine. In the meantime, um, I I will abuse my power as chair to ask ask you a question, Marie. Um, so it struck me when you were talking about um, the early twentieth century um, notions of closeness and distance um, that. Uh, that this was something that many thinkers associated with urban modernity as, as causing distance, a kind of alienation, the alienated masses, arguments rehearsed by people like Georg Zimmel. Um, and, and I was thinking about Walter Benjamin writing in 1935, who um, famously kind of says, well, you know, this alienation between people also equals alienation with the world and is also really dangerous because it means that people are indifferent and are therefore not politically active. And what I like about what I, I was, I've been interested in um, Benjamin's argument is that he's, he puts forward kind of like a radical solution, namely the idea of shocks. And he says, we have to shock people into, um, I guess, connecting connecting with the world around them, connecting with others. And he sees the realm of culture and art as a place in which those shocks could take place, namely film, which is how I became interested in it. So I was wondering in your research, to what extent do you, do you find people positing potentially surprising solutions to distance when distance is conceived as problematic for the reasons that you outlined? Um, as, as being sort of political. I mean, let me, that's, 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 that's a really interesting question. Um, I think, I, I think culture is indeed, I mean, like the, the point that you're making of via, via Benjamin, that, that, that culture is something that connects us is, is actually a kind of a, um, an interesting, I think, parallel uh, development throughout the, the 20th century where, um, I mean, and that's obviously connected with, with empathy, mm -hmm. um, that, that, that we can kind of ha have insights into the lives and minds of others and therefore 
um, maybe have a better understanding um, of um, of people that are of, of lives that are distance distance from from each other. Um, and then there, I mean, that's and, and that's that's definitely an interesting argument, I guess. Um, in in the in the theory in the theorists that I'm looking at, there's more of a I think um, caution, like they, they're a bit more cautious um, about the effectiveness of of empathy than that, mm -hmm. that, right. that um, because I mean, like like for example, um, Paul Bloom um, who says, well, we we are psychologically unable to care for people who are um, distanced from us in, the, in a, or for many people is that, that are distanced um, from us um, for any prolonged sense of time. So, so those sh it would be interesting to, um, to ask, for example, Paul Bloom, what he would say about the, the shock um, effect of maybe feeling, um, feeling kind of connected. And, and, and I guess the, the, the question is how long can, can this shock last and how, how often do we have to, um, do, uh, do we have to, um, yeah, maintain those 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 shocks. Um, another another big um, um, traditional uh, big big thematic field there is of of course um, the media right now and images in the media that bring suffering close and that have also kind of led to a kind of reversibility, as, as Judith Butler says, for example, re reversibility of closeness and um, and, and distance. Um, so, but but what do we do with those images? How um, so yeah, that's that's I think what I would say to this at, at the moment. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Marie. So, in the meantime, we have a, a really a lot of questions. So, thank you, everybody, for 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 writing those down. Those who haven't yet, please do. Um, so, we have a question um, to you asking what you expect the outcome of your research to be. For example, an analysis of attitudes to distance or very interestingly, and a question that I also wanted to ask, a recommended code for how we should distance or not in the future. So what would the codes of conduct be? I guess, what do you think um, for, for, for now? And, and what are the expected outcomes of your research? That's, I mean, I wish I knew the, the, the outcomes <laughs> where it's in my, in my first year of the project, but um, I think at the moment I'm, I'm aiming for the former, for um, at, or first of all, uh, an analysis of those attitudes and um, um, yeah, an analysis of those positions that um, argue for a cultivation of distance. Um, and also for, for the different ways that distance can be, and, and this may be this, um, what you could call a kind of a dilemma of, of, of proximity and, and, and distance. So do we have to be connected? How connected do we have to be? How can we, um, do we ha how, how do we maintain distance at a healthy level? And I think um, what I found so far is that there's um, these, these thinkers that, that are concerned with distance tend to be concerned with, uh, as I've already touched upon in my talk, um, with a, um, the, the kind of, securing of, of, of a um, public sphere. Um, but there, there, there is some, some, some problem with, with, at least in, in my mind with that. And there are other thinkers that try to circumvent um, that but when, um, when how, how do I make this clear? Um, and I think the, the, this, the way to circumvent this, this kind of detached, maybe, maybe this detachment that, that is um, an element of, of those theories. Um, is the idea of what I would call implication. So I think before we, um, if, if identification is a pro problematic closeness, um, so we, we, if, if we have to identify with the other in order to understand or care for the other, then, then we have a problem because like Paul Bloom says, we can't identify with everyone. And even if we do, it might not be appropriate. For example, um, there's, uh, um, yeah, the, the, this, I, I know how you feel is often not the, the an apt response to to a suffering that doesn't affect you yourself, right? Right. But implication may be like to think about how you are implicated, how we are implicated in suffering that is happening at a distance. Um, that is, I think, I mean, that that sounds very easy, uh, like very simplistic right now. But I think that's that's maybe the third way that I'm seeing in the theories of cohabitation. Yeah. Yeah, that that's super interesting, and and also something that you haven't really touched upon is those who would, and relevant to your other research on primary rejections, those who'd say, actually, I'd rather stay distant. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm, 
Um, and I have another question for you. Um, do you have reflections about cultural and religious distinctions? Um, do Northwest Europeans find closeness particularly problematic? Um, which is a really interesting question, particularly since I think, you know, your talk, you did touch on cultural distinctions of problematic Eurocentricism, but used um, our and we um, quite a lot. And I was wondering to what extent that, that those um, reflections on cultural and religious distinctions as this, as this um, questioner poses um, play, play a factor. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is, um... I think there is actually quite quite a lot of interesting stuff happening right now on that front. Um, that is also a distancing, um, that, that also very interesting in, in terms of distancing practices. Um, because if I mean, if you look at at those those um, those distance theorists that I, I introduced here, they would probably just say, "Oh, well, it's it's great, like kind of this idea of um, um, pluralism that that they want to." Um, that they want to kind of enable, um, but that is taken is not taking in, in, into account that they're um, in, at least in, in the or that in the West there are dominant cultures um, that um, yeah it's so far away this that we're so far away from this kind of beautiful public realm where everyone can bring in and it is, everyone is respectful with one another um, that but but actually I think um, in terms of the the integration paradigm that is maybe a closeness paradigm. The idea that oh everyone has to integrate and then we are a pluralistic um, society that is very harmonious. There there have been certain certain movements of detachment from that, and uh, I'm going to give um, an example from from Germany right now. Um, the um, poet and, and essayist Max Chalik, There is a, um, a Jewish right. I mean. Uh, he's also self-identifying as Jewish, has, but also obviously struggling with the label that comes when people say, oh, you're a Jewish writer. Um, so he's a Jewish writer who's, who's written this interesting um, book, Disintegrate Yourself, uh, Yourselves. And he's, um, he's arguing for, for an detachment, basically, from, um, from Jew because in, in, in Germany, there's a lot of uh, this, this myth of the um, Christian Judaic worldview that is used to exclude um, others in a way. They say, okay, the Jews and the Germans, we have overcome um, our post, we, we are a post-racist society. We've, um, we, we've integrated, the Jews have integrated, we have to, we've formed together a unit. Um, so therefore we can say this, for example, the, the Muslim, um, the Muslim world who does not, the uh, Islamic world who doesn't fit into our cultural um, unit. Um, so, so Cholik is pushing against that and said, we should disintegrate. We mm -hmm. should not ha um, have the German mainstream culture do that to us, that, 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 we, are that we are used to create this, this idea of harmony. Um, so yeah, I think that that's an, a very interesting um, example of um, kind of distancing mm -hmm. um, that is not, um, yeah, that is not just um, about respect and, um, and like in this ideal form, but a very, very radical. Um, in a way, a very radical approach to that. Um, absolutely, and uh, that idea of disintegration is wonderful. It's also a kind of you can't you can't know me as a complete whole either. It's a kind of rejection of uh, knowability, um, which which is which is very clever, I think. Um, another question here um, from an attendee: What might be the implications of defining intimacy? in a way that's apart from sexuality. So the more impersonal concepts of friendship, respect, um, and so on. Um, which, which other intimacies? Um, can, you, can you see the Q&A, Marie, just so that- Can I? Oh, press yeah. Q&A at the bottom. Um, and this is not me asking you to take on, take on the job, but just no. in case you need to reflect on the question a bit more. Um, um, if you need to think about that one, we can also we can also circle back to it. Um, um, good. I, I guess I'm not seeing. Oh yeah, there's the intimacy question. Um, mm -hmm. I think intim they're, they're different. Of course, when when we think about, I mean, intimacy is the a clo closeness of, of of human contact, right? Um, and in, in, for example, in sociology, there's often two groups um, of, of how people relate to each other, strangers, there's people we don't know at all, um, acquaintances, 
um, that we kind of know and intimates. So intimates would also include family members that we close that we feel close to, um, close friends and obviously lovers. Um, I think intimacy is not necessarily sexual. I mean, intimacy is a is a form of interpersonal closeness. Um, and but in in and as a positive concept, it just means that that we feel connected, right? And that we feel seen by by the other, feel understood. Um, Intimacy can also be, well, is I think um, by, by de definition also ex exclusive. <laughs> uh, and therefore, I think that like intimacy can um, take on a, a problematic connotation when it becomes the leading principle um, at a social at a social level, because then it becomes you can't be intimate without a certain form of identification. And you as we've seen via Paul Bloom, you can't feel you can't really identify to an, an unlimited amount of people. So that will necessarily lead to exclusion. Um, so this is where I was, um, I guess, coming from when I was talking about intimacy. Mm. That makes it clear. Thank, thanks, Marie. Um, uh, and a question here about, um, or rather a comment, I guess, about the law. Um, uh, one attendee says, I note the law has long navigated the social dilemma of needing distance as well as human interaction through the metaphor of staying at arm's length. It suggests the need for self-protection, even while mutual benefit is possible. The human connections can be negotiated, but with care and armed with the spines of legal rights, both universal and individually agreed upon. Um, I guess this is touching, I mean, I guess this person's comments touches on many of the considerations throughout the 20th century. And perhaps it's interesting that these are still questions or topics that we're, that we're, that we're discussing. I mean, perhaps you could say something about if, if you have comments about the law um, or if your thinkers have engaged with questions of um, legality or rather I should say maybe um, formalized codes of conduct. I think in um, I think there's so many things one, one could say about, about this. So, so it's, it's a very, really interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, and um, especially I'm really interested in this this metaphor of staying at arm's, arm's length that I actually had not known that that was part of legal discourse. So I will have to look that up. Um, but um, there's actually an, a very interesting book by, by the political philosopher Roberto Esposito that's called Immunitas. Um, and there he's, um, he's, he's kind of comparing how the law um, functions a bit like the immune system, like the, uh, like the immune system of the body. Um, it's, it, this is like very simplistic now, and it's hard to, to bring the, 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 the whole theory um, into a, a two second um, explanation. But um, because it because it reacts as opposed to preempts or yeah, it, it kind of I mean for Esposito it um, yeah it it, it, it prevent I mean it prevents violence like it, or oh, okay it, it doesn't prevent violence it's just a legal form of violence so mm -hmm. so he kind of likens this this uh, um, idea of um, of of a vaccine where you use a, uh, basically a safe um, form of the pathogen again some some of the scientists in here will be like <laughs> oh, yeah. I wasn't trying to explain vaccine vaccination but um yeah where, where, where you you use a um yeah where, where you use the the, the in, yeah the the pathogen in, in a safe way to um to immunize immunize the body against it um for for senate for not for senate for for esposito there's um yeah there's a the parallel to the law that uses basically sanctioned violence, state sanctioned violence um, as a form to prevent um, to, to re prevent anarchic violence in, in the society of, of people. So yeah, it's a very interesting, I think, question. Yeah, yeah for, for sure. Um, it's so it's so wonderful how your topic is prompting so much so many great comments and questions from coming from different directions, Marie. You must find this a lot when you talk to people about what you're doing, I would imagine. Especially now it's a little bit like everyone is like exactly. um, yeah, it's 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 such a timely project. Um so there's one more question um which is works perfectly with, with the time. 
um, or comment. Um, somebody says, is social distancing not the wrong way to think about it? Should we not be, be finding physical distance but social togetherness? The public, public realm is threatened by atomizing. How do we create the sense of togetherness in the public realm without overly exposing individuals? Um, public views um, tend to be around individuals who are first put on a pedestal and then knocked down. Um, this is the, the claim about a, a web, web, webinar, isn't it? That you can't ask people to, to elaborate. Well, to sort of clarify, but I mean, I, 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 I think this person is touching on things that your thinkers are also touching on, namely that, that, that it is absolutely necessary to find a, 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 a way of being together. Yeah. Um, and I guess there's also an interesting, um, well, like, clash of, of, of closeness and distance that also comes to, comes across in, in, in Senate when he says that there's an, an overemphasis on the private, which, but which leads to withdrawal. So in a way it's too much closeness, but also too much like basically a vacation. Like it's, it's the, the public realm becomes empty because we all withdraw into our, um, our private little lives and that obviously is what, what I was trying to to kind of express in the in the last um, section of my talk that that in a way is also um, and, and I think that's that's in line with what, what this person is saying um, is that yeah they, I agree with with you um, <laughs> um, that, that that is is a danger right now that um, that I mean I think that like, for I mean what has also what we haven't touched, and this is also too too big of a topic right now, I think. But what has also happened this summer was not just coronavirus, but also um, obviously the Black Lives Matter move, the, the reinvigoration for, for tragic reasons, obviously for of the Black Lives Matter movement that has shown that it is indeed still possible to, um, yeah, to 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 find a public discourse on 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 um, and, and to to find um, solidarity. Um, in, in, in larger forms, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it is definitely ha has become so much more complicated and so much more difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, uh, I can hear the college. I can hear some some college bells ringing out um, to say that it's uh, six o'clock. Um, and and so I, I think maybe I could just end by saying an absolute massive thank you to you, Marie, for bringing such stimulating, interesting, um, and exciting research to us um, this, this afternoon. Um, and I see that Shell, Shell, has, Shell has joined us, so I'll hand on to you. Thank you. It was just to say a thank you to you both. Thank you to you, Marie. A, a very interesting discussion, and of course, so relevant uh, for today. And thank you so much to Leila for chairing. And thank you to all of you at home for watching. We've got more online events coming up in November, uh, panel discussion on women in finance on the 4th, um, entrepreneurs panel discussion on the 16th. Um, and then we're back with our online quiz with a bit of a twist for our 670th anniversary on the 19th of November. So hopefully see you at another online event soon. But thank you again for watching and a huge thanks to Marie and Leila. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.